Nick, as you can see. So you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on GitHub. I have a bunch of interesting stuff there. And I was doing this talk on CamJS and it was a bit accidental. So I've heard talk of uh, JAD about React and stuff like that. And I figure out that it will be incomplete without this part. And this is a really cool thing. I'm going to show you some good parts. And the only, like, I must warn you, so this is all kind of bleeding edge. And uh, the only downside of it, so eventually if you embrace these practices, you may start looking like a hipster. So just <laughs> be aware. Uh, so, well, I'm, I'm trying to talk about some what what we can do to make our code better. So how we, uh, what kind of tooling we can use to have really good developer experience. So just in case DX is new feature, it's called developer experience. It was uh, a bit a little bit uh, forced in React <coughs> Europe. I like it. So. What we need to make our development experience better. So we want to have our code to be good and consistent. What do we need for that? So we want to have some static analysis of the code we write. We actually like really want, maybe you personally don't, but usually we want to have some code style guide. So the code looks pretty much the same across, uh, across the team, across different people. Uh, you may have this, like code nuts in your team, to make a code consistent, kind of person like me, and but code nuts in your team doesn't scale, so it doesn't work really well. And you obviously want to have code reviews, and you want them to be really good, because, like, I like this picture, it shows <laughs> what code review is. And so if, if you actually want to go this left side, not the right side, uh, you really want to have some code style and you want to have your code consistent. So to achieve those values, what you, what you can use in terms of tooling. So you can use uh, CI, CDs, continuous integration, continuous delivery, it's, it's delivery, it's a little bit different, but uh, you, you want to have some continuous integration. So you want to run your tests automatically, you want to check all those, uh, all the code to comply with your styles, with everything uh, automatically. But it, it's kind of always good, but you always have this issue that you need to set up this stuff. So you need to have some server, you need to have someone with the knowledge, or you need to spend your personal time to do that. So you need to have, again, some extra tooling and put some effort to get it working. And if you do some small things, you write some modules, you don't really want to slow yourself down. Um, and you obviously usually skip this step because it's just too complicated to start with. And it's kind of OK, because uh, now we have compiled language. So JavaScript now is basically compiled language. I would say it's really, really difficult to find a project that uh, just fits your JavaScript as, as it is. When I, when I think about compiled languages in JavaScript, uh, like what comes to the mind first is like CoffeeScript. And um, I never liked it. I didn't like it. No offense, it's just personal. And why it wasn't really OK that time? Because um, we simply didn't have source maps or things like that. So you, you write some code, it's compiled, and then you have basically no way to debug it. And it's already solved properly. So now you can compile your JavaScript from whatever format to format that your browser will understand. And you will have full source map support and everything. And you can debug everything. And you can do it in Chrome. And it's all really good. And you can obviously use any kind of syntax, uh, like JSX, if you use React. Or eventually, you may not have to use React uh, to use JSX, I don't know. And obviously, you can use now ECMAScript 6, ECMAScript 7. And why we need to compile these guys is just because of this. <laughs> and like our most browser somewhere here. And this really, really nice green 
thing is Babel.js. Thank you, Sebastian, <laughs> for the awesome tool that supports basically everything. So with Babel.js, you can compile a code and it will run on any browsers, any like not ancient, ancient, ancient browsers who support TypeScript 5. And then you can compile and you can package your code with Webpack and why Webpack I'll show a bit later. Uh, just my tool and tool of choice for lots of developers now. And then you can have your hot reloading in there, which is like, I was saying that my talk will be kind of fail shade of what Dan Abramov told, like, but it's still kind of a thing. It's a really good thing. You should check it out. And I actually put this link to his talk here, so <coughs> you can get it. And to make our code consistent, to have some analysis, you, you want to have some tool to, that, to do that, and it's ESLint. It's a really cool tool. It supports all modern ECMAScript 6 stuff. And if you use Babel uh, compiler in there, you can go even further, having like ECMAScript 7 and whatever, and it will pass really good. But then uh, you also have multiple plugins for that. So you can have plugin for React, and it will check your React code as well. So it doesn't miss something. So the cool thing about this whole stuff, you have a lot of tools. You can run them in command line. You can do it manually. But then having things like Webpack allows you to bring all those tools together to your compilation step. So you don't need to separate your development uh, from checks or something like that. So whatever you do, whatever you check, uh, whatever you type, it check right away before it actually spits to the browser. And here is like a super simple React application example. Um, there's my stupid type, type faster, please. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> yes. So we have something like really, really stupid and simple. So we get some header, cabin, and footer, um, fit in a div, show in a page. And then, um, can you zoom in a bit, please? Yep. Yeah, and we have some content. I actually show that because I, I'm, I will use it in just my five minute live coding demo later. Um, just in case everything is broken, here are some screenshots so you can see it kind of works. So then we can start our application having all things set up. Setup is quite simple. Uh, React. Uh, React is transpiled by Babel. Babel supports it natively as well, so you don't need to care about it. Then Webpack bundles everything to the file. It's all good. You can start it in the browser. It's also working. It's all good. Then what's really cool about it, you have hot reloading, and it's, it is, it's an absolutely amazing technology, and it works absolutely cool with React itself. Uh, why exactly? Because if you change your code, uh, so, for example, I add something here, like so many cool people around here, mm -hmm. and I don't need to refresh my browser, and Webpack actually does incremental build of that stuff, so it doesn't really regenerate everything. It only picks up the module you changed, only content file. It, if you can see, it was initially a couple of seconds, now it's about 200 milliseconds, uh, and then, your page is just updated with that thing without refreshing the whole page. So it's, it's actually a really cool feature of working with React because every component is completely kind of pure and independent and React reconciles what's been changed. It doesn't update your whole DOM. It only, when I do that, it only updates this little part. The whole page stays in the same state. If you have some form filled in, it will stay filled in. You only have one little thing changed there. It's really nice. And why I was talking about like ESLint and other things. So if I make any mistake, so let's say I won't do some really hard mistakes, I will do some really small mistakes or miss my semicolon here. So what I get in my console, I instantly get this ESLint error. It will tell me what's wrong. But if I, for some reason, it, it's in the background, I get it in the Chrome as well, in my DevTools. It's all there. I can see it. It still compiles. It's kind of fine, so you can still work if you don't do really big mistakes. So if 
if you just miss semicolon in full frame pilot, uh, you can obviously disable it and restrict your compilation on any kind of errors. But it's just part of, of your workflow. So you have a little bit of live coding, and hopefully it will all work. Um, <coughs> I've got stuff set up here, and I do npm start. So is it big enough to see? Yeah. Yeah. All good. So it's all compiled. Um, <coughs> I need to refresh the page. It's just the first time. So here it is. It all works. If I if I do whatever changes, I save it. It just updates it. Um, as you can see, uh, it's your page is connected to the server via socket I/O. It's you, sh you shouldn't really care much about it, but it's just technically how it's done. And React Hot Loader sends all those small bits and pieces to the front end. Uh, uh, I wish I can, in just a second. So yeah, it, it just changes color. And, and as, as you can see, nothing actually flickers here. So the whole page stays. So it doesn't change anything. It only changes this small little piece. And then if I, what, what I was showing, I can just do some stupid, silly things. And I will see all those mistakes and something is wrong here. I can fix it. I also have, like, if, if you use WebStorm or use any idea, uh, you have full support for ESLint. It works really amazing. So you actually have it in the code as well. So here we go. Um, go back to my slides. Yeah, uh, this is a really cool workflow. We use it uh, basically day-to-day -day basis in my job, and it, it's really amazing. And migration to that thing doesn't take much time. So if you want to implement, uh, so for example, we used to have Ruby, uh, and we used to have sprockets that will build our assets and everything like that. It literally took about two days for me to migrate the whole application to Webpack build. It doesn't really take much time, so you can always go gradually. So, you know, like you have the big file with list of all libraries you include in your JavaScript if you use Sprockets, and then you just literally preg and replace that to require, just common JS require, and it just works with Webpack straight away. The build is, is quite simple to set up. And then um, main application was built with, with Angular, so I've just added new functionality with React, and that works pretty well as well. Like, I have no problems with that, so I can easily do and have all these sh new shiny features in there written in totally bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, this is the link. So this whole stuff is on my GitHub. You can go there and just clone it, check it, try it. It's, it's all, I kind of keep it updated all the time. It's more or less as a basis for my other modules. Um, you can have you can you can have a look to ESLint rules. Um, I keep them as kind of a cheat sheet, so you can you can see all description for every rule, why it's like that, and so on. It's and I'm I'm kind of as I mentioned I'm kind of code Nazi, so I actually have all room rules and they're all raised to error level, which is to you can be not, not as crazy as I am, so should, shouldn't go that far. Um, so yeah, check this out. It's, it's really cool. Play with it. That's it. Do we have any questions for Nick? We do. Why would you use Webpack as a powerful grunt? I mean, what does Webpack give you? Uh, um, the question is why we're using Webpack, not the Gulp or Grunt. Um, you can actually use Webpack with Gulp or Grunt. It, like, it's just a different kind of things. They do different things. So instead of, like, ideally, Grunt and Gulp, they're just task runners. They don't do anything. So everything else is done by different things in there. So you run different tasks. 
For us, we use uh, npm scripts instead of that, those, and Webpack is just a compilation level. So Webpack does packaging for a JavaScript. You can use Browserify instead of Webpack. It's, so I would say you should compare Webpack more to Browserify rather than Gulp or Grunt. But like Browserify has, like it, it's more like personal choice for many people. I find Webpack much more powerful and much easier to set up. And it has really nice concepts in there. And it works really fast, as you can see, like doing those incremental builds all the time, it's just milliseconds. And it actually, by the way, this um, quick start has kind of um, karma, test setup, basis is there as well, so you can see. It works pretty well with karma. You have like code coverage, everything's there. So all, all the basics. Uh, how do you find using NPM uh, I'm actually quite happy to use NPM scripts only. Uh, the only kind of downside of it is a little bit harder on Windows machines. Uh, the thing is, we don't use Windows machines. <laughs> so we all get like MacBooks and we don't have this problem. Who doesn't have MacBook has some Linux in there? And like no problems at all. Um, like I, I used to use Grunt for a long time and I find it like it's, it's okay, it's good. At some point your configuration become like a huge mess of stuff, you don't really know what's happening there, and it's quite difficult to support. Then it comes to Gulp, and Gulp seems to be really cool, and it's much faster, but it's much more complex. Then you have streams, you need to combine streams, you need to then push streams somewhere else, and it becomes like really complicated at some point. And you, you don't know why would you actually need that if you have just scripts. You just run scripts one by one, and that's it. Super simple. And if you actually like, then then scripts, you can just make scripts folder, put a bunch of sh scripts in there, run them. But then you still have the Windows issue. You could use a cake file. Yes, <laughs> yes. So if you really target on Windows machines and you want to have this completely bulletproof, you probably go with Galp or Grunt or Broccoli, something like that. Or a cake file. Or a cake file. Or if, yes, or you talk with Jed and he will give you like his bunch of pre-compiled Gulp stuff from NPM that you can use. <laughs> yeah. Another question? Yes, we do have the back. Is command not really that big a problem that we need tooling to solve it? Uh, sorry? Like reloading. Huh? I don't understand why, why do we need something that reloads pages for? Oh, that's the, that's the key feature. It doesn't reload page for you. It actually replaces only bit you changed. That's the really cool thing. So for example, imagine you load a really, really <coughs> large page with multi-step form in there, and you do testing for like last step of it. And then you came there to the last step, and you change something. And then you need to change your code. And then you're, oh. And you go. Fred. Go back to your live demo and create some state, and then change the component that's rendering the state. Yeah, if you can. Absolutely, I can show you. Here we go. Uh, I actually should have done it before. So <laughs> you have your input. It doesn't refresh anything. It only changes this little tiny bit you changed. It's it's really awesome thing. You you can't imagine how much faster you do development with this thing. You can do mistakes. You can go back. You fix mistakes. You go back. Mm -hmm. You don't need to refresh, and mm -hmm. it's just instant. One more question before we move on. No, okay, well, Nuku, oh no, we have to on the front, sorry. How does CSS integrate with um, all this? Oh, it, it, it integrates pretty well. If you, so I'm, I'm not sure if it has config in here. Uh, so there are different ways to do styling in here, and you can do it in like different ways. A lot of people use just CSS 
uh, JavaScript, CSS, just styling right here as I've done you know, like that way. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool, but it's not really nice to write it because you have a lot of tooling that works with CSS really well, like have your IDE that supports all this linking for CSS rules, auto completion, everything. You don't want to lose it. So there are there is absolutely amazing thing that's built by Mark from Melbourne, um, which is called CSS modules, and now it is part of Webpack CSS loader. So you just in your configuration you just say, I want to use CSS with modules, um, and I don't have it here, but you can do like modules. Am I okay with time? Yeah. Huh? yeah. Awesome. So you can you can use modules with your CSS loader, and then you import your CSS styles as you do with I don't know like as you do with JavaScript. Let's say I'll do style sheet, which is called content. Oh, I need to put it down. <laughs> Um, so just normal CSS, it's all good so far, so good, just nothing really fancy. You can use everything here like uh, media queries or it's up to you CSS. To reload it because I changed um, I changed the config for Webpack, so I had to restart everything. And um, did I make any mistakes here? Could you just be class name whatever? Yeah. Um, no, I just start. <coughs> should be should be okay. Um, oh, maybe I need to restart it again. It usually works pretty well. I may not update my dependencies here. It is fairly possible. It, it's pretty new stuff. And I actually use it um, day to day. I migrated basically all my components to that thing. Shouldn't class name be styles because you're importing No, no, no. It's, uh, it actually gives you class name. It gives you a bunch of classes here. I'm not really sure. It's. Uh, Sorry? When you were entering a config, I think there was an extra S, so we adding a module. Oh, that's fairly possible. Modules. Mm, you mean, no? Yeah. I think it should work. <laughs> yeah, live coding never works. <laughs> <laughs> so, the thing is, you should check it out. CSS modules, it just works. It doesn't just work for me. <laughs> <coughs> I can debug it, obviously. Check it. Let's see if it actually works. Ah, we have some problem here. That's fine. Yeah, I don't have any styles. Yeah, that's. Probably possible. I didn't update my dependencies like CSS loader, so it just doesn't support. Um, style loader. Stuff. Sorry. Style loader and CSS loader. Style, CSS loader. That's fine. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it is working. I'm using it every day, and it's really nice. <laughs> so you you basically completely abstract your CSS, and what it does, it takes your component name, uh, it makes some uh, random hash for each class. So you have this whatever, you have your content underscore whatever, some random hash in there, and so you, you never have flashing styles on your page ever. It's done forever. So you have completely isolated modular styles, mm -hmm. and you still write your CSS properly as usual. 
The only thing is you don't do nesting here. Nesting is bad. So you actually write just class, plain classes. If you do a lot of nesting, uh, other classes will be transformed as well. And that's not really a cool thing. If you want to combine multiple classes, you can still do it. It's, it's all easy. It, you just do it in JavaScript here. Say I want to use this class and the other class. It just works. And I actually really, really like this stuff. Um, so we tried JavaScript styles. We tried library which is called JSS, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, it does all this JavaScript styling. It all works really well, but it doesn't hand, like you can't, the developer experience is not perfect because you write JavaScript uh, and you need to basically type all these things. So here if I just do like hide zero, it just does all this stuff. If you don't have it in JavaScript. So that's any people systems? Sorry? Any CSS people systems? Oh, no. SAS. We use, like, in one project, uh, we use SAS. It works as well. I don't like SAS because it doesn't work really well with Node. It has its issues. Um, it has issues. Um, <laughs> I, I, sp I spent some time resolving that. It has issues. It works. You can use SAS loader. You can use less loader. Whatever you, you want, you just chunk them to the to the loader section here. Just more stuff. It all works. Just plain old CSS is good enough usually. And you see the transform from JavaScript styles to this one as well. Just regular placing stuff. That's it. Good place, Nick.